Hi, uh, this is Dr. Ronald Wharton. I am a cardiologist at Montefiore Medical Center in Bronx, New York, and assistant professor of medicine at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And today I'd like to take you through a case of a fast heart, why the tachycardia? Scenario, this is an echocardiogram obtained on a previously healthy 65-year-old gentleman who is acutely ill. You can see in the parasternal long axis um, a uh, heart that is going rather rapidly. Um, it looks hyperdynamic, um, and uh, the chamber sizes appear to be normal. In the next slide, you see an M mode through the aortic valve, it actually starts in the mitral valve and then in the middle of the screen it heads over to the aortic valve. And take a look at that for a second. You now see an apical four-chamber view, uh, 2D image only. Take a look at that. In the next slide, you can see a continuous wave Doppler through the tricuspid valve with a maximum velocity of the tricuspid regurgitant jet of slightly more than three meters per second. This is a pulse wave Doppler, which I'd like you all to look at through the left ventricular outflow tract. We can now ask the question, what is going on? Are we dealing with a case of endocarditis? Is this an acute myocardial infarction? Is this an acute pulmonary embolism? Is this acute aortic insufficiency? Or perhaps this is just a manifestation of a systemic illness like thyrotoxicosis. Take a minute to think about it. What do we see? Well, the left ventricle is clearly hyperdynamic and tachycardic, and any of the above conditions could cause such a scenario. We can also infer the presence of pulmonary hypertension, even though I have not given a mean right atrial pressure, I haven't shown any images of the inferior vena cava, we know that the peak systolic pressure in the pulmonary artery is 36 millimeters of mercury plus the mean right atrial pressure. So even if the right atrial pressure is normal, we have at least mild or mild to moderate, depending on your definition, pulmonary hypertension. So could this be endocarditis? Well, there's no obvious vegetation, even though admittedly a transesophageal echo is much more sensitive than a transthoracic echo. However, at least grossly, there does not appear to be anything on the left atrial surface of the mitral valve or anything on the ventricular surface of the aortic valve where you would usually expect left-sided endocarditis. Although I only showed one image of the tricuspid valve, uh, I can tell you for a fact that there's nothing on the right atrial surface of the tricuspid leaflets. Pulmonary embolism? Certainly a pulmonary embolism could cause a degree of pulmonary hypertension. If it's a first pulmonary embolism, typically the PA pressures don't go much above the mid-50s. Uh, however, the right ventricle in the one image that I provided, the apical four uh, chamber image, does not appear to be dilated or hypokinetic in any way. It looks as vibrant, vibrant as the left ventricle. So that's not quite as likely. Could this be thyroid toxicosis? Well, a thyroid storm can cause hyperkinesis of all, uh, of both sides of the heart, but there are no specific findings to distinguish that from any other entity that causes a hypercatecholamine state. Could this be acute aortic insufficiency? Well, other than trauma, the only things that really cause acute aortic insufficiency are infection or dissection. As we already stated, there doesn't appear, at least on the 2D imaging, to demonstrate any lesions on the aortic valve. And the aortic root is normal in size. Typically, dissections don't occur spontaneously in normal-sized aortas. 
More importantly, aortic insufficiency should cause an increase in the velocity of the left ventricular outflow tract. If you recall, we have a pulse wave Doppler of the LVOT that actually demonstrates a low velocity. Therefore, aortic insufficiency is highly unlikely. Acute myocardial infarction. When one is first looking at echocardiograms or first learning how to echo, how to look at echocardiograms, one might not think of an acute myocardial infarction as causing the left ventricle to, to appear hyperdynamic. However, there's something odd about this. Look again at the left ventricular outflow tract time velocity integral. Is this what one would expect with a ventricle that appears to be hyperdynamic, where the ejection fraction appears to be greater than 75%? Well, no, it's not. Typically, the velocity should be higher, and the width of the jet should be wider. In fact, if we time the ejection period, which is what we're doing here in the M modes of the aortic valve, you can see that the ejection period, which I've measured at the upper right corner, is 180 milliseconds. A typical ejection period in a healthy left ventricle is closer to 300 milliseconds. So let's take a closer look at the images. Here again, we have an apical four-chamber view. And if one looks very closely, you'll notice that the lateral wall is akinetic, and if you're not sure, compare it to its friend on the other side, the septum. The septum is thickening very well. The lateral wall is not thickening at all. And if you look very closely, there is a ruptured papillary muscle. Next slide. I'm now showing you the original slide of this presentation, but now with color. And you can see that there is a flail mitral leaflet, posterior leaflet, with severe mitral regurgitation. Next slide. The flail can also be appreciated in the following two images. First, in 2D, this is an apical long axis uh, image. And if you look closely, you can see the flail posterior leaflet, if you missed it before. And in the next slide, you can see the same thing with color placed on top there is a very severe eccentric mitral regurgitation jet. So teaching points here, acute myocardial infarction can still cause the left ventricle to appear hyperdynamic in some circumstances, and the most common circumstance is acute mitral regurgitation. There are a few other teaching points here. Um, first, acute mitral regurgitation can be difficult to see. First of all, invariably these patients are intubated. Intubated patients cannot turn and help the sonographer get pretty images. And in addition, you're forcing air into the chest cavity. Air is a terrible conductor of ultrasound, and both of these can degrade your image quality. So if you have a sick patient with an acute myocardial infarction and you suspect severe mitral regurgitation, even if you can't see the jet, there are other things that can help you. The velocity of the mitral E wave may be increased, although frequently E and A will be merged because the patients will invariably be tachycardic. More importantly, in the presence of a hyperdynamic ventricle, if you see a small time velocity integral through the left ventricular outflow tract or a small ejection period, either measured on pulse wave Doppler of the LVOT or the M mode of the aortic valve, those are clues that all of the blood isn't going where it's supposed to go. The other thing that I should mention is that acute mitral regurgitation in the setting of a myocardial infarction can go in any direction. Even though the posterior papillary muscle is far more commonly affected because of its unilateral blood supply, or rather its, its single blood supply, papillary muscle rupture can affect either leaflet because both papillary muscles give chordae to both leaflets. And therefore, depending on the leaflet that's preferentially affected, acute mitral regurgitation can go posteriorly or anteriorly, and therefore one has to listen throughout the entire precordium to see if you can hear the murmur. And beware, you may not hear it at all, because the duration of the jet is smaller or shorter in duration, 
and you will frequently hear the sounds of the ventilator in the background. This is also a good time to get a transesophageal echo if you're not sure because the anatomy can clearly be delineated. And to that end, I always mind, remind my own fellows where I work that if that's ever necessary, my colleagues all live closer to the hospital than I do. So if, if it's 4 o'clock in the morning and the interests of patient care, even if I'm on call, they should wake up someone else because it's just the right thing to do for the patient. Anyway, I hope... This has been educational, and thank you for tuning in.